Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this seminar um, hosted by IBMA. Um, the official title of this seminar is Love Listens, Part One. And uh, my name is Sar Peters. Um, although I'm a psychologist and um, I live in Nashville, I am actually here in my capacity as parent. Um, I have two children who uh, play this music and absolutely love it. Um, and I have had the pleasure of um, going to many different festivals as well as IBMA, um, just being a spectator um, as part of their team. And um, I'm very privileged. We have an amazing panel here today. Um, I am joined by Trey Wellington. Um, Trey will be a senior um, at East Tennessee State University. He is an absolutely amazing banjo player. I love his playing, huge fan. Um, and so we're really, uh, we're very privileged to have him as part of it. Um, we also have Jake Blunt with us. Um, Jake Blunt has his bachelor's degree in ethnomusicology. Um, he is also an absolutely amazing fiddler, banjoist, and vocalist. Um, and has been an incredible mentor to many young musicians um, throughout this music, in including my own children. Um, we also have Dan Boner, who is a professor um, at ETSU. And Dan is part of the Bluegrass and Old Time program there. Um, so I thought we would kick this off just um, by having each of our panelists introduce themselves. Um, and just start off by telling us how you got started um, in this music, how you got interested in it in the first place. Um, so Trey, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Trey Wellington. Um, the way I got started in this music is growing up, um, I was listening, I would started on an electric guitar originally, but um, I'd go up on, in the summers. And just start off by telling us how you got started um, in this music, how you got interested in it in the first place. Um, so, Trey, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Trey Wellington. Um, let, um, let me chime in for a second. I'm sorry. Um, if everybody could mute their... Um, everybody who's on the Zoom meeting, if they could mute themselves, that'd be great. Thank you. So we're really... Uh, we're very privileged to have him as part of it. Um, we also have Jake Blunt with us. Um, uh, is that good? Okay, awesome. Well, I'll, I'll start over. Uh, my name is Trey Wellington, and um, I got started in this music. Um, I would go up in the summers and spend a lot of time with my grandfather, and um, he had all these great records. Um, he had a lot of, like, um, rock and bluegrass and um, some – kind of country things and we um so we'd go around and we'd listen to all that different kinds of music um all summer we'd go fishing and we'd just do outdoors activities we'd always be listening to music and so that was kind of my first introduction to it and um it was mostly more on the rock and country side I didn't really um get that much into bluegrass until I was probably about 12 I heard it really for the first time and um so I started playing electric guitar probably when I was like 13. Um, and the reason I did this was I was hearing a bunch of these like rock albums and I was wanting to learn all these kind of shredder guitar kind of things. And um, so I got an electric guitar when I was probably 13 and um, I was also in the band at this time and I was playing trombone. And um, But then I wanted to learn, I was listening to a bunch of um, Doc Watson because my grandpa had some of his CDs, and um, I was hearing all this Doc Watts, and I was like, oh, I want to learn how to flat pick guitar, and then I went into this club um, called the Mountain Music Club in um, eighth grade, and at my middle school, and when I went into that club, that's where I heard a banjo for the first time in person, and I remember that was just like a eye-opening moment. I was like, this is, this is awesome, is what I thought, and um, so... Yeah, after that, I got a banjo a few months later and started learning some. And, um, I mean, this become my main interest. I kind of put everything else down for a long time. But, yeah, that's kind of where I got started. Thank you, Trey. 
Thank you so much, Trey. Um, Jake, why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this? Absolutely. Uh, I, like Trey, also started out as an electric guitarist. Uh, <laughs> definitely a common trait in our generation, for sure. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I wasn't super close to a vibrant bluegrass scene. Uh, a lot of what had existed in D.C. in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was sort of uh, petering out by the time I started to get really involved in local music. But when I was 16, I went to this awesome show downtown. Uh, it was in the Ethiopian restaurant of all places. And it was this woman playing a washboard and a guy playing the banjo. And he was playing claw hammer banjo and I'd never seen it before. And I went out to them afterwards and they introduced themselves. Their band called Megan Jean and the KFB were still friends. Uh, they've been great mentors to me. And Byrne, the banjo player, explained to me where the banjo originally came from and started telling me that it had traveled over in some form uh, with enslaved Africans and taken the shape that we now know here in the Americas. And I did some more digging into that, especially after Black Lives Matter began to heat up later on in my time in high school and in the beginning of my, my college years. Uh, really started trying to find out what oral record my ancestors had left behind. And the banjo and the fiddle were really important parts of that for me. And uh, yeah, I just sort of got one or two banjo lessons from my advisor in college and uh, just jumped in <laughs> and uh, haven't looked back. Thanks so much, Dan. Well, I I can't remember a time when I didn't know and love bluegrass music. Uh, my dad's family is from West Virginia, and uh, they all moved north, including my dad, to southern New Jersey, the hotbed of bluegrass. Uh, there, there's actually a lot of bluegrass in that area. Danny Paisley could tell you all about it. Um, but I grew up going to a Free Will Baptist church and everybody in there was from Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, West Virginia. So, I mean, ever since I was born, I just remember being around this music. My, my great uncle played, people in the family played and uh, learned to sing harmony and played bluegrass, was in a couple of gospel groups, bluegrass gospel groups growing up when I was like, you know, seven years old, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And, uh, I decided I wanted to go to college and I called East Tennessee State University and I said, I hear you have this bluegrass program there. I want to major in bluegrass. And they said, well, ha ha ha, you can't major in bluegrass. There's no such thing. And so in 2010, after I started working there, after I graduated, uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, I helped to, to co-write the first ever Bachelor of Arts degree in bluegrass old time country music, of which Trey Wellington is a student. Wonderful. Um, thanks to all three of you for your introductions. Um, I want you all to, to sort of feel free to, to chime in and guide the conversation um, in, in sort of whatever direction. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that um, at, as someone that, that came to this music as an adult um, and I, I learned about it because of my children's interests, primarily. Um, I want to get back to something that actually all three of you touched on in different ways, but one of, one of the things that has been most striking to me about this genre, um, and, and I'm, I'm using genre in, in a very broad term because, um, because to me that spans bluegrass as well as old-time music, but one of the things that I really love is the way that the music gets passed on um, from generation to generation. Um, and it is something that um, I know even, even my parents, when they were visiting um, and uh, watched their very first jam said, oh my goodness, like where else would you find an eight-year-old um, and an almost 90-year-old playing this the, the same kind of music in a circle like this? Um, 
And Jake, I know you touched on on the history um, and sort of using the the music as as a connection to history. Um, and I just wonder if you'd say a little bit more about that because I think it's one of the things that's most unique ab about this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's been one of my continuing sources of fascination for an old time in bluegrass and on the rare occasions when I put the scholarly hat back on. Uh, it's something that I've spent a lot of time researching as well. I definitely think that I benefited a lot from the intergenerational friendships that resulted from my involvement in old time. Uh, later on, once I sort of became as tangentially involved in bluegrass as I am right now, even though I don't really play it very much, um, to have the friends that I do, uh, older folks who are able to give advice and to convey different perspectives and information, right? I haven't had as much time to gather data on the world as a lot of my friends, and it's really helpful to have their advice and input from a professional standpoint and a personal one. I think one of the most important experiences that I had musically was when I've been playing for about a year, I went to the Augusta Heritage Center in Elkins, West Virginia, and I spent a week with Rhiannon Giddens and Hubby Jenkins in a class that was just called, I think, Black String Band Music, or maybe African American String Band Music. And they just took us through probably five to 10 different artists and talked about the ways that they played and how to listen to the source recordings and what tunings were involved. And it's, you know, I was at the point where I sort of got a lot of the peripheral information about it, but having them go into detail and hearing that from other black people um, who were older than me and who had learned from Joe Thompson, right. were very directly connected to the lineage of source musicians that I was interested in working with. Uh, it definitely gave me a great, great opportunity to broaden my own perspective and learn how, how to learn the music. Uh, that's a skill in and of itself. Uh, Trey or Dan, anything, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, kind of when I was um, starting out playing music, um, you know, at first I didn't know a lot of the history of the banjo at first i didn't know where it'd come from when i first started playing and um it was actually one of my teachers um steve lewis in high school um we had another i was lucky we had classes in middle school and high school where you could just learn bluegrass music and like learn how to just go and play and is my slack off period <laughs> but um yeah so um he actually recommended me watch the bela fleck throw down your heart um movie and i didn't um and that kind of opened up a lot with the roots of the banjo because i really didn't know the roots there at all and um ty, and um, then we would talk sometimes about like ties to the local area i grew up in around um kind of the western north carolina area and um yeah so definitely advice from old like people like um older than me definitely helped me out a lot Yeah, I, I would say, too, that there was always this feeling that I appreciated when, you know, if you think about the jam session circle and how, you know, there, there are certain ones that are in the middle of that circle, the ones who are more accomplished and play a little bit more. And there are some that, that are on the outside edges. I mean, even just theoretically speaking, you know, like... Um, you know, there are people as they're coming along that they're they're a little hesitant. And I always did appreciate those people who um, who knelt down to me and said, hey, bring your fiddle over here. We want you to play with us. That that was a very different feeling because then th there were other times where that circle wouldn't open and people can say, well, you can bring your instrument. Come, you know, but that was that was different than saying we want you to play with us. Most definitely, um, and and thank you for saying that. So I I what um what I want to follow up on a little bit is um something that that um, Jake and Trey I think you both touched on this 
a, a little bit already, but um, if you could just, um, like my kids, for example, came to this music because in part, um, they loved the sound. Um, they loved being able to make music together with other people. So the, the communal aspect of it. Um, for my daughter, Uma, in, in particular, it wasn't until um, after she plays the banjo, she plays claw hammer banjo. Um, she was inspired to do so after seeing Rhiannon and Giddens um, because prior to that time, she didn't know, um, I mean, she was seven years old at the time, but she did not realize <laughs> that any women played the banjo, much less um, any women of color. And so that was actually something that, um, as a young child who was very interested in this music, um, but it, it, her, her personality remains um, sort of a little more introverted, um, having that connection to somebody who looked a little bit more like her was actually something very powerful. Um, and for Uma in particular, continues to be something very powerful when, um, when she's in jam circles and when she's in these communal settings because she really wants to participate. Um, just having a source of familiarity has, has helped that along a little bit more for her. So I wonder if you all would just comment um, a, a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think representation is super important and uh, not only amongst people of color who I think have multiplied in these genres in recent years, largely because of the work that Rhiannon and the whole Carolina Chocolate Drops band did and continues to do in their solo careers now, um, you can really see the impact that seeing other people like you doing something has, even for adults. And I think when you're as young as Uma was at that point, that's a really different thing, right? Kids do internalize all sorts of different things about who is supposed to be doing what because they're learning who occupies what role in human society at that age, right? They're learning adults can do certain things and kids can't do certain things. They're learning different categories do different things. And uh, being exposed to someone who can show you, yes, I look like you, we share so many of these things in common, that means you can also do those things. It opens a lot of doors. And I think as adults, sometimes we learn rigid categories because we haven't had exposure to people like that. And with my work with Bluegrass Pride, I've just heard so much from people who thought, who have said, I didn't think I was allowed to do this. <laughs> Uh, or I didn't think that I had a home here. I didn't think anyone would let me in. Um, and it's just, it's incredibly important for people to have experiences like Uma had, like I definitely did when I found out about the chocolate drops, uh, that there are more doors open to us than maybe we sometimes expect. Uh, yeah. A big thing for me when I was um, learning how to play is um, just kind of like touching back on what Dan said. And um, he was saying like, you know, people that were just not like kind to him. And, you know, a lot of the time in bluegrass circles, um, it's kind of, you know, just like Dan, uh, not to repeat everything Dan said, but you kind of got like some like jam circles that are like, they're just like, oh, no, like you can like you can come and like sit in. But then like we're never going to let you have a solo. We're never going to let you do this, let you do that. And I think a big learning part that a lot of people forget about in this music is letting those people because a lot of people who are older forget that there's people just like that for them that were letting them come in and play with them. And that's what a lot of people forget. And um, that's kind of I mean. I don't want to say it's an ego thing, but and they might not even know they're doing it, but it's kind of one of those things. A lot of people expect you to have experiences and like know how to do something, like know how to jam with people. But then when you don't have people that are going to let you jam or like let you into their circle and like learn from them, how are you ever going to grow in that? Absolutely, yes. Um, 
And I know Gary, Gary, my son, has has commented on that when um, he he actually had an opportunity to work with um, some younger kids, like sort of at an instrument petting zoo, and they they were interviewing him about it, and he said, you know, I was in that place not very long ago. Um, and I remember what that's like. So if I'm ever in a position where I can help and, and encourage young children who want to be a part of this, I, I definitely want to have the opportunity to do that. Um, and I know that's something that um, when Gary and Uma were working with the, the Gray Fox um, Bluegrass Academy last summer, um, there were lots of questions and answers from, from budding musicians ab about things like that. Um, Dan, I want, I wanted to get your take. Um, and obviously Jake and Trey as, as well, because all three of you, I, I think are amazing students, um, and historians as well, but I wonder if y'all could comment a little bit more on how important is it, um, to know the history of this music and how, how does that inform your playing? Because, um, I, I often notice that there's, there's a duality. Um, th within this where, you know, um, well, I can play this music and I can be an absolutely amazing musician without completely knowing exactly where this came from. Um, and, and that is definitely one perspective. And then there's another perspective that is very rooted in history. Um, and, and, um, in, in terms of, of educating the broader collective about where this comes from. So I wonder if you all could comment a little bit more about that. Well, I think an ethnomusicologist uh, uh, could could speak very well about that. Um, from my experience, I remember when I was learning more about the history and how real it became for me, that I, I started feeling like a participant in something much bigger. Um, Back in the late 80s, there were several video documentaries that came out, like The Father of Bluegrass and The Mandolin of Bill Monroe, uh, where we got to hear the origin story. You know, it's, it's almost like reading Genesis or something. You're, you're learning about, you know, Bill Monroe and, and you know, learning from Arnold Schultz and, and Uncle Penn and, and carrying that music up and through. Um, it, it certainly does bring with it some mystique and mythology as well, depending on how the history is presented. And the great thing about being at a university where we study this kind of music is that, you know, we have academic scholars who are digging even deeper, you know, to, to, to understand not just the narrative that we've been told, but the context that goes back even further or alongside that maybe hasn't been talked about as much. Um, I, Jake, I'm curious to, you know, you're the ethnomusicologist in the room. I'd, 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 I'd like to know what you think. Yeah, I think there are a lot of different ways to know the history of something. And I, I think that I definitely benefited in terms of my artistic vision and motivation from knowing more about where the music comes from and all of that. But at the same time, I think if you dedicate the time that's needed to learn how to play a traditional genre like bluegrass or old time or anything else, you're going to pick up on a lot of the same rules and uh, genre constraints that sort of carry on from the earlier generations, right? I don't think it's a coincidence that everyone in old time sort of starts out on Bruce Molsky and then like runs off into field recording land. Um, and I get the sense that there's a similar arc in bluegrass music of like, you find your way in, maybe it's Alison Krauss, who knows, and then all of a sudden you're like way back at Bill Monroe. I'm curious to know what, what do we all have to do to, to move forward? You know, what, what do we do? It, it might be, I mean, you know, you think about the history of this country and how many, you know, kind of um, milestone developments we have with civil rights and 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 so forth and you know it will it take that much more time for a place like a bluegrass festival to to shed those 
those images and that feeling and, and how, how, how do you all feel when you attend events like that? Sorry, you mentioned your, your children going to a, a bluegrass festival and having to find a, which areas are safe and which areas aren't. Sure, absolutely. So I think um, at, as a parent, um, we have have learned with each successive experience. Um, and there are, are some experiences and festivals that are absolutely fabulous um, and where the kids have felt incredibly welcomed. Um, I think, um, you know, Augusta Old Time in Blues Week was was a real highlight um, for the kids. Um, the, the Gray Fox Festival was um, probably their favorite trip. Last summer, um, they they had an absolute ball there um, and, and felt very welcomed um, in, in many different circles. Um, there are other places where um, I'll, I'll call them microaggressions because it, it is usually not something that that's terribly overt. Um, it, but it may be um, things like seeing a Confederate flag and then sort of second guessing, um, oh, maybe that's a campsite that, that we should stay away from. Maybe we should go in this other direction. Um, Will I be welcome in this jam, or or maybe I, um, you, you know, maybe the two of us should just go and and sit over here um, and start something and see who comes up to us instead because we're not quite sure where to go. Um, and there's definitely been a learning curve with that, and it it has been um, our experience that there there are different places um, where that's handled very differently. Um, Jake and Trey, feel feel free to chime in here with, with your experiences as well. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, this is always a, a tricky issue, especially with the, the flags, but I think that it doesn't even have to be that overt sometimes. Um, and I think, again, this is one of those situations where now that I've been in the community for a few years and... I sort of understand, I have my footing in the bluegrass and old time scenes. I don't feel that worried when I see one or two flags flying at a festival or whatever. Um, Cause I know like, oh, it's just like those people, they're around, whatever. I'm not happy about it. But were I driving around and I saw a large group of people gathered in RVs with Confederate flags out and there wasn't bluegrass happening, I wouldn't stop. I'd be like, I'm going to get beat up if I walk in there. And I think that there's a certain survival sense you have to develop as a minority in this country um, that you have to be able to read a room. And all of us are going to have different, you know, gauges for what feels friendly and what doesn't and be used to different amounts of like Confederate flag waving or anything else because we're from different places, right? As I am constantly harping on on panels like this, most black people that come from cities like where I come from are not gonna go to a festival that's like in the middle of nowhere in the rural South because that in and of itself is coded as a dangerous place to us because our parents and grandparents left there and had all these horror stories for us. Now, as an adult, I know it's way more complicated than that, right? There's still tons of black people who live there and are fine. So I don't wanna like buy into the like, South is bad, the North and the cities are safe. We know that that's not true. But at the same time, if we're talking about how to make everyone feel welcome, we have to acknowledge that the geographic location, the flag paraphernalia, all of that sends a certain message that might not be true of people. And once you get to know folks, like I've had the opportunity to do, stay on people's couches, learn music from them, teach music to them, play tunes together. I don't feel very threatened when I go to Mount Airy or whatever, and I see those flags flying. If I didn't know the people who were there, I absolutely would make the choice not to stop. And I think that's just a conversation that needs to be had for sure. Yeah, and um, in my experiences, um, 
it's hard to tell a lot of the time what is meant as a racist kind of sentiment and what is meant as just somebody being kind of a jerk, you know, a lot of the time, unless it's something like outright, because, you know, like you can go to a jam and, you know, it's like, you might get some weird looks and you don't know is that because it like, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Is it because of my race or is it because of like, I'm not playing, something to their liking or that's kind of like that's a kind of like a hard topic to get into but like and I've had some like very just like upfront kind of racism stuff with me you know it's um going to some festivals and people literally coming up and you know they'll be drunk and they'll come up to me and say stuff like oh you don't belong here stuff like that and those are kind of like blatantly racist remarks that I know okay that person meant that in that way, you know, and, but it's kind of hard to, I mean, I try, unless somebody says something blatantly to me, I try not to make assumptions about the people themselves, because I don't know what they're meaning when they're, you know, if they give me a weird look, I don't know what they mean, or, you know, I just try to keep an open mind, like, give everybody benefit of the doubt, because that's, you know, not, like, probably eight times out of ten, they're not even thinking about that, but, you know, I think you both, um, all all three of you actually have hit on a point that um, speaks to the importance of personal relationships um, and and those those one-to-one or small group connections um, and how powerful that is um, when when, um, you're new to a community and trying to be a part of it. Um, But also when you're trying to navigate um, some of the these, these overall really complex societal issues um, that when you get down to the level of, of personal relationships, it actually, it, and um, you meet people that treat you with mutual respect and dignity, um, as well as respecting your playing, um, singing as, as a musician, that, that does make a tremendous difference. Um, one of the things j- just to follow up on, um, I think you all all have um, have touched on, is um, I want you all to speak to um, what your ideal vision of the future of this music would look like um, with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion in particular. I think that's a tough question. I mean, of course it's a tough question. That's why you asked it. But also, (laughs) um, I think it's difficult to think about because inclusion is always a moving goalpost, right? Like as soon as you get one thing done, there's another thing that needs doing that isn't any less important. And I think the more I consider, like what would my ideal bluegrass or old time or just general music festival look like the more I realize like that might not be everyone's ideal picture um and part of what needs to happen is just investing the time to make all of those different experiences happen Uh, I don't think that's something that's beyond us and I think the more we invest in welcoming more people in the more things we'll be able to do we'll have a bigger audience but I've definitely been made aware over the past few months, uh, in particular, in one really long late night conversation I had at Youth Traditional Songs Weekend in January, where I was talking to a number of disabled folks who were just talking about not being able to go to any of the camps that I go to because like they couldn't get around in their wheelchair or, you know, festivals booking stuff you know if they have the like street crawl situation in a lot of different venues they'll book their shows in upstairs bars or downstairs bars that aren't accessible things like that that you know i hadn't thought about until listening to those people talk i was like wow this is just a huge blind spot that we're not really acknowledging um there's always going to be something like that what makes me feel comfortable 
might not make everyone feel comfortable. I'm a person of color, I'm queer. I'm still a cisgender, able-bodied man. There's like a lot of things that are just basic functional necessities that I have wherever I go because of how privileged I am uh, that not everybody does. And, you know, the ideal festival for me might be outside. It might be, you know, out in the woods somewhere. That wouldn't really work for someone who couldn't get around when it's muddy, you know? Uh, and I think one of the things we're all gonna have to learn to do is like, learn to not get too attached to things looking one way uh, or to the way we're used to them looking because the change has to happen for additional space to be made. You know, that's such a, an interesting thing you just said because so much about this music for so many people, it, it, it like lives in the same place that their religion lives. The way Earl played it, the way Bill played it, the way that so-and-so always did it because we love those sounds. I mean, if you love bluegrass and you love Flatt & Scruggs, well, man, that's like the pinnacle. Uh, we don't want that to go away, uh, but there's room for so much more. Uh, but it, 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 so it's like religion. Bluegrass is like religion at times. It's also like uh, somebody's favorite sports team, you know? I'm from the Philadelphia uh, area, and we all know that uh, Philadelphia fans are just like the most diehard fans in the world. And, uh, you know, whether it's the, the Phillies or the Eagles or whatever, um, people don't want to, to root for another team. Uh, these are very human things that that we all have to deal with at different times. Uh, change is inevitable for all of us. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt Trey if you were going to say something. Yeah, so kind of my um, – you didn't interrupt me, by the way, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah, so my thing um, that I'd kind of – you know, would be good about the future of bluegrass, you know, there's kind of like this thing where, you know, you just kind of want to be I'm trying to figure out how to put this into words. It needs to be like, you're just like somebody else. You know what I mean? Like you have, like when you're playing, you don't want to be like, you know, I've had people just tell me you're a good, you're good for a black person playing banjo or, you know, like that, you know, like, I just want to be looked at as a good banjo player. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, that's kind of, if I, you think I'm a good banjo player, like don't put a label on like, why can't I just be a good banjo player, you know? And that's kind of something that I would like to see in the future is just like not all, have all these labels. Like it doesn't have to be a big deal that I'm this, you know, like I'm this way. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Um, thankfully, nobody has ever told Uma you're good for a girl, but she did. She, people have come like ever so close to that before. She did have one comment um, from a really, really established musician who told her that um, he was really happy that she was starting with claw hammer banjo because it was easier. And then as she got more comfortable with it, she could learn how to play bluegrass banjo. So that that was that was definitely an amusing conversation. But I think um um what you all have have touched on is that um this music is is unique in that it's rooted in tradition and history. Um and and yet we live in a society that is ever changing. Um and is diversifying. So how, um, how can you be good stewards of the music and the history um, and yet innovate and, and push things in, in new directions? Um, and I think all three of you have, have done that very well, by the way, already. Um, but whether it be through, um, through songwriting, through the music that you play, through interviews, um, that you do camps, workshops, um, teaching, college courses. Um, wonder if you all could comment on that, of just some, some tangible ways maybe um, to move things along.
Yeah, I think that's a thing that a lot of musicians have done, um, kind of, you know, because, you know, any musician that's an established, like, professional musician, kind of, they have all studied, usually, people before them, you know what I mean? It's kind of like a big thing to grow in your own sound, because, you know, I heard at a, um, when I was first starting to learn, I was going to a lot of banjo camps, and I heard at a banjo camp, um, you know, I think it was a Alan Mundy maybe that said this, that might be wrong, but, um, you know, you take something from this person, you take something from that person, you take something from this person, you know, you have all these influences at the end of the day. And, and, you know, there's so many people out here that get hooked on one or two artists and that's all they listen to, you know, that's all they ever learn. And, you know, then they end up just sounding like copies of those people. And, you know, I mean, there's a place for that, I guess. But, um, you know, if you're not innovating yourself, there's. I heard somebody say one time, there's already been one of so-and-so. You know what I mean? There's already been, you know, like banjo players. There's already been one Earl Scruggs. You know, guitar, there's already been one Tony Rice, Clarence White, Doc Watson. There's already been one Sam Bush. You know, you're nobody's ever going to sound like the, them people again. So why only try to sound like them? Well, you take all these different sounds and combine them because then that's when you're going to get your own stylistic diversity there. Yeah, I think this is something that sort of happens organically, like Trey was saying, that eventually, if you dedicate enough time to your craft, your own voice sort of starts to come through. I think that can happen a lot of different ways, like making an informed choice like Trey was talking about to incorporate a new sound or to meld a few different influences together. I definitely have heard friends, I think my friend Tatiana Hargraves talked to me once about finding her own sound by like imitating someone else really closely until her own thing started to show itself in the ways that she couldn't match that person. Um, and that was sort of my experience of spending four or five years just trying to sound exactly like Judy Hyman, my fiddle hero. And then at the end of it being like, oh, <laughs> I don't sound anything like her anymore. <laughs> I got close to the sun and then fell. Um, and it's just part of the growth process. I think one of the things that I'm really interested in seeing that I think is happening uh, more and more in bluegrass and old time is kind of embracing the fact that history doesn't really look like the way we were taught it looked for these genres that old time and blues and gospel and so much of that early music that bluegrass and so many other things came out of were all sort of feeding into one another for a really long time and there weren't clear divisions between those genres until someone came in and decided they had to chop it up to sell it effectively and what I'm now seeing folks doing is finding ways to question those artificial man-made genre boundaries and say, hey, these things weren't meant to be separate from one another. Uh, you can say that there are different, there's a gradient there and that they all fall at different points along it or something like that. There can still be differentiating characteristics, but when did we get the idea that the genre should be so rigid. Is that idea a historical, right? The more you delve into the history, I'm sorry, I live between a hospital and a fire station and a police precinct and uh, someone's in trouble. So praying for them. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that one of the, the ways forward is to look further back than the commercial music industry. Uh, we've really gotten sold one idea of what music can look like and in particular one idea of what selling music can look like and i think the more ways we find to look back further than that and say oh i can pick up these other threads that i've been told i have to discard uh the more we'll find new sounds new inspirations uh, and the genre will progress Isn't it, isn't it interesting that all of, in, at least in bluegrass music, how all of the, the people that we try to emulate so much themselves were trying to do something different the whole time. They prided themselves in 
Bill Monroe invented his own kind of music. Um, Earl Scruggs invented his own style of banjo. The Osborne brothers plugged in. They wanted to be different. And in those early festivals that Carlton Haney put on, there was a lot of diversity musically in those, in those festivals. So, um, and if you talk to any of our heroes, Jesse McReynolds, he wanted to play differently from Bill Monroe. Bobby Osborne wanted to sing higher than, than other guys, you know? There's this rich history of, of, of being different. And that's a good thing. So I wanted to take a moment and thank everybody for their time today. Um, and I'm gonna let you all um, just contribute some parting thoughts. Um, just very openly, um, what, what do you want to leave people with? What, what do you want them to take away from, from this discussion today? I'll start. Um, I, I hope to see a community, a world where people just simply treat one another with kindness. It's, it's very, very simple. You treat everybody respectfully, kindly, uh, welcome people to, to participate in what you're, what you're doing. Um, I'm, you know, I, 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 we shouldn't have to have a panel about this, you know, it should, should be something that we all um, do inherently. And uh, it, with the theme of listening, I would encourage people to listen more. Um, I, I wanted to share one thing that my, that happened to me when I was about 18 years old. Uh, my best friend in New Jersey, his mother committed suicide and he and I were very good friends and, and we would talk frequently, you know, he, after that happened, he would, every so often we'd talk about this and and I was, you know, thinking I was being a good friend, I would give some advice and say, well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this. And one night we were having dinner and uh, at a restaurant and, you know, he was saying something, how he was feeling. And I gave my 18 year old advice to him, whatever good that was at the time. And he just kind of paused and he said, you know, Dan, Sometimes I wish you'd just listen to me when I talk instead of trying to solve my problem. And uh, I've never forgotten that. And, and I've, I have continued to try. Sometimes I do better than at other times, but to, to listen more and speak less, not to tell somebody how they should feel about something, but, uh, but, to, but to be a, an observer and to be supportive. Well, I guess, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm always thinking about concrete actions folk can, folks can take um, to address these concerns. I think it's, it's really important to do what Dan just talked about, to listen and to sort of let the folks who are in the less advantaged position lead the way when it comes to these topics. And, uh, you know, pay attention to the fact like we're giving you actionable solutions. There is a way forward. Um, and that's not going to happen if you don't listen. Uh, but at the same time, we're in a moment right now because of this pandemic where all of the existing inequalities in all of the industries, but especially the music industry, since literally no one is working, um, all of those existing inequalities, economic, racial, gender, whatever you can think of, are going to become more severe because of this, right? Who has the resources available to wait this thing out? Who has the health needed to survive this? Um, this is a time where so many of those existing imbalances are going to get worse unless we do everything we can to support the community through this. So 
if I could leave anyone with a parting thought, it would be to go donate to the IBMA trust fund because it exists specifically to support people in times like this. Uh, and I know it has been since the pandemic started and will continue to do so. So thanks IBMA for making that a thing. Please everybody go do that. That is the most important thing you could do right now to make sure that there is a diverse and inclusive and equitable music scene waiting for us when music is allowed to be a scene again. Um, I think my part, parting thought would be kind of just um, kind of touching on what Jake and Dan both said is just be kind to people as much as you can. It's a, um, you know, and another thought I just had was don't, you know, so many people get so upset because they're like, oh, like, why are you, you're talking about a whole group of people. And, you know, if you're helping a cause and like you're listening, like Dan said, then that's one thing. Then, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that don't, and those people know who they are um, deep down somewhere. And I just think it's one of those things that, just like Dan said, like it just needs to be more of a listening thing than a, and I think everybody could do better at this. It's not just one person individually. Listening and listening empathically is one of the very first skills I had to learn in becoming a psychologist. And um, that that applies so much um, to discussions like this, but also just interactions in day-to-day -day life. Um, and I, I think you all touched on um, music as art. Music speaks to people. Um, the very best musicians I know, I feel like um, I, I am sharing part of their soul and, and their collective experience. Um, and so perspective taking in terms of how can I honor that um, and really hear that, um, I, I think is, is taking this all in, in a direction that it needs to go. Um, wanted to thank the IBMA um, for, for having this platform um, for creating this, this discussion format. Um, very appreciative to all of our panelists today. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for their time.